we're discovering that actually biology matters we can't wish it away we can't uh, wipe it away with a, with, a, with a magic wand or with some crazy technology that people really do care which mother carried them to term what kind of society do we want to build for the future what kind of world we want to create for our children to be born into these these are vital questions for everybody and uh, yes I think that as Christians we do have something very specific and actually amazingly relevant to contribute to this important debate. Hi there, it's Justin just popping up to say that today's show was recorded shortly before the outbreak of war in Ukraine. So some of the references to the situation there will have changed, including surrogacy in Ukraine, which is, of course, in as much turmoil as the rest of the country. But with that caveat out of the way, on to today's programme. Well, hello and welcome to this week's edition of the show. If you're watching here on YouTube, do make sure to like today's video, subscribe to the channel and check out the info with today's show to get more from us, the podcast, the newsletter and more besides. I'm excited about today's show. We're dealing with an ethical issue. Um, Ukraine's surrogacy industry is sort of the hook on which we're talking about today's ethical issues around reproduction. The ethics of paying for pregnancy, essentially. John and Tim Wyatt are joining me. Um, well, Ukraine has been obviously very much in our news in recent weeks as tensions with Russia have escalated. Less well known is the fact that Ukraine is a major destination for so-called reproductive tourism. Their surrogacy policies allow women to earn significant amounts of money compared to the average wage by carrying foreigners' babies as surrogate mothers. Well, today my guests Tim and John Wyatt uh, are here because they're starting a new podcast or they're launching their current podcast on the Premier Unbelievable Network. It's called Matters of Life and Death. I'm really excited about this new show that's joining our network. Um, John Wyatt is a doctor and bioethicist who frequently writes and lectures on the intersection of Christianity and medical ethics. In fact, John will be one of our speakers at this year's Unbelievable Conference on the 14th of May. And he sits down on the podcast to talk with his son, Tim, who's a journalist, uh, to look at current events in the world of technology, biology, medicine, all from a theological and ethical perspective. So today uh, we're going to be joined uh, by both John and Tim to talk through the ethics of surrogacy at home and abroad. Ukraine is by no means the only country that's seeing a boom in surrogate mothers. Uh, plus, we may get to other ethical dilemmas that exist uh, in terms of infertility, IVF, the increasing trend towards uh, genetic modification in reproduction and so on. But first of all, let's introduce John and Tim. Um, perhaps we'll start with yourself, John. Uh, welcome along to the show. Um, tell us a little bit of, of your background. You have a, a long and distinguished career, uh, both as a doctor, as a bioethicist. Um, tell us about some of the, the highlights along the way, if you would, John. Yeah, thanks. No, it's great to be here, Justin. And um, I, as you say, my background is as a medic. I, uh, I came to London uh, initially, it's, it's nearly 50 years ago, would you believe, and started uh, training as a doctor at St Thomas's Hospital here in central London. And uh, and then uh, did a number of different things, but increasingly was attracted towards the world of paediatrics. I, I, I loved kids and went into the, that field and then ended up as a specialist in caring for newborn babies. And uh, the technical term is a neonatologist. Uh, I worked in a big intensive care unit here in central London, uh, where I had the privilege of caring for many, many uh, babies, some of them incredibly tiny. And um, it's really through that work that I realised I was in the midst of an ethical maelstrom. There were all kinds of new ethical challenges coming up as technology was advancing. And we were in a very cutting edge area of medicine. It was raising all kinds of questions. You know, was it always right to resuscitate every baby to try and keep them alive? Is it ever right to switch off the life support machinery? And what about reproductive technology and, and test tube babies and advances in genetics and issues about abortion? So that because of all these issues, I, I increasingly felt that these were things I had to tackle, particularly from a Christian perspective. Yeah, great stuff. Well, we'll come back to you in just a moment to talk a bit more about the new podcast, Matters of Life and Death. Um, Tim, you, you are the, the host or co-host of this podcast. Tell us a bit about your background as well. Obviously, you are the son of John. That, that's the first thing to mention. Indeed. But, but how, where does your own interest in these sorts of issues stem from? 
Yeah, well, I, I had the the good fortune or misfortune, depending on how you see it, of um of being taught through some of these issues that Dad was bringing home from the hospital around the dinner table as we as I grew up, um, which I guess was the kind of set, sowed the seeds of a, of a fascination with not just medicine but um kind of how Christianity intersects with with public life and, and social issues. And so, um, I'm not a scientific scientific person. I'm I'm more of a words person. So I ended up going down the road of becoming a journalist and and um. Uh, uh, after a while, I ended up. I found myself working for a, uh, a, a newspaper covering the church, and so started becoming very interested in, in in the church and in faith. And for the last four or five years, I've been a free, I've been freelance, and my kind of specialism is is again that intersection between religion and, and social life. So it's a lot about kind of what's going on in the church and other faith groups, but also about issues that that people of faith are fascinated or concerned about, whether that's homelessness or divorce or assisted suicide. And I, I, I really am passionate about trying to speak both to people of faith and to those without faith in different publications uh, about how to better understand um, what values is driving people uh, and dig into some of these things that, that are of greatest concern, I guess, in, in life. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. And, and thank you for the, the podcast, which I think was really a, a lockdown project, as so many things have been in the last couple of years. Tell us, tell us what gave you the impetus to, to start the Matters of Life and Death podcast. Yeah, it was it was a bit of a lockdown project. Uh, yeah, well, perhaps I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Tim. T- t- you, you start us off, and I'll, I'll bring you. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Uh, it was a lockdown project. We we started uh, the show um, back in in twenty twenty, just a few weeks after COVID had pinned us all down in our homes. Um, it it was really. Um, uh, uh, John has been working for many years. Uh, he r- writes books and gives talks and, and kind of has developed a whole kind of suite of resources about trying to apply his medical knowledge to to help Christians think through ethical issues and what, what we thought was a podcast is a great platform to get that information or to that conversation out to, to younger people, people of my generation who, who maybe are less likely to, to turn up on a windy win, Wednesday evening, maybe at a church hall to hear, for, hear from dad. And so it was really wanted to have a conversation, an intergenerational conversation between uh, John is the expert, the ethicist, the professor, me uh, kind of asking the stupid questions that the, that the audience might want asked and, and to really have a gormous uh, interflow of ideas across across the generations to, to hopefully prize open some of these issues, some of these questions that people might have. Mm. And, and I think you, John, have, have really appreciated because of lockdown, because of the need to go online get on zoom calls you know so much of what you would normally do now happening in the digital sphere it's kind of opened your eyes a little bit to the fact that actually th- this work can reach a very broad audience actually but because of you know what lockdown has taught us in the process yeah absolutely it's blown me away the way the how good the technology is and uh it, it's opened up for me uh, lots and lots of possibilities particularly across the world of, of uh, engaging uh, with doctors and with other people around the world and um i've really enjoyed working with tim and and again his background in news and current affairs and journalism is it's a really important perspective to try to communicate the technical stuff that i deal with in, in a way that really engages and makes sense with where with where people are today Yes, that's great. Well, I'm really pleased that we're bringing the Matters of Life and Death podcast into the Premier Unbelievable network of of shows. I, I think it, it'll it'll really help in terms of fleshing out some of these ethical issues that are so important in in the current age and and Christians and non Christians to think through some of the implications of of where technology is taking us and and how we make sure that it doesn't dominate us that we are still in control if you like and so on um tell us tell us about some of the issues you covered so far and and plan to cover maybe tim you start off with with some of the issues that that you have covered so far in the podcast yeah well um funnily enough it, even, although it was a lockdown project we hadn't really intended it to be a, a kind of covid podcast but we found <laughs> that we were launching a podcast about ethics technology and healthcare in the middle of a global pandemic and it seemed wrong to do anything else so for the first few episodes we we dug into 
uh, a whole heap of issues around COVID. We looked at how Christians have coped through periods of plague in the past and, and what that might teach us today in the present about how we can live distinctively. We looked, of course, loads around the vaccines. We discussed some of the concerns that Christians and others had around the vaccines. We talked about the ethics of compelling people to take a vaccine or not, the different technologies that are, that are lying behind the vaccines. We talked about lockdowns, about um, different ways of controlling the virus and limitations on freedom and how how we might think about the ethics of that but we've also moved away from covid so we've also tackled things as varied as we did a kind of um retrospective about john stott who was a, a close personal friend of of my dad and, and went when 100 years after his he, he was born uh, who would have been 100 years old we talked about christian leadership and uh, and some of the issues and and the legacy of his ministry uh, we've also done gosh artificial intelligence and robotics all kinds i've lost track <laughs> mm, yeah no I, i've i've listened with great interest since since getting hold of it and and i just so enjoy the interplay between you i think i think it's it's actually really fun having a, a father and son kind of dynamic going on in the podcast as, as because you're you're kind of there and you you, you can't offend john or, or you know well, it's particularly when we're talking about fertility like you know and, and, and here is the product of, of my yeah. my and my wife's fertility you know <laughs> arguing back i mean it's ridiculous it, 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 exactly exactly <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it gets a bit meta at times in that way. Anyway, um, I, I'm again just really pleased that we've been able to to to, to bring matters of life and death to to the Premier Unbelievable Network of, of podcasts. Uh, there is a link from today's show if you want to check it out for yourself. Start listening. Do highly recommend it. You get the archive of shows that have already gone out, but there's some really exciting stuff in the pipeline as well as we as we begin a new season. So um, yeah, um, today though, I thought um, why don't we talk through a significant issue that we haven't really covered on this show in the last few years at all, really, uh, and and that is the ethics around reproduction. Specifically, as I mentioned in my intro, you know, there's some really interesting stuff going on around the world in terms of the surrogacy what i've termed industry because it feels a bit like that in certain parts of the world um before we kind of look at the specific situation in ukraine what what are the laws in the uk and and in other countries at the moment john around this issue of, of surrogacy and what does it actually involve specifically when it when it comes to other women carrying another couple's baby yeah so so it all comes under the heading of reproductive technology and, and really that starts way back in the late 70s. 1978 was when the first test tube baby was born here in the UK. And um, what the development of reproductive technology meant was that you were able to get access to different parts of the reproductive process. So you could isolate sperm and eggs, you could create an embryo in the laboratory, and then you could take the embryo and put it back into another person's womb and so all these kind of different permutations and combinations start to become possible through the technology and surrogacy is just one of the possibilities that reproductive technology opens up but the idea of surrogacy is that uh, either an individual or a couple who are desperate to have a baby but who for whatever reason uh, are unable to do it by the normal means, they can create in the lab using a sperm and an egg, they can create an embryo, and then that embryo can be transferred literally across the world uh, and implanted into the womb of another woman. Uh, she carries the baby all the way through until the baby's born the normal way, but at birth that baby is then taken away from the carrying mother and is given back to what are often called the commissioning parents, the ones who uh, actually organise the process. And in the UK, um, this this has been recognised for a long time, but uh, the, the rules, the law is very strict because the law says that it's the, legally the carrying mother is the legal mother of the child. Whatever, however the embryo is created, the woman who delivers the baby is the legal mother of the child and she cannot be forced or compelled to give away the baby, even if money has changed hands. And the other thing the law says is that you cannot have a, a legal commercial uh, arrangement. Uh, all you are allowed to do is to provide reasonable expenses for the carrying mother. So surrogacy does happen, but it happens more as a kind of voluntary arrangement. Mm. And sometimes it's like a family member 
uh, it might be the the sister mm. of the of the of the original couple or something like that who agrees to undergo this surrogacy arrangement but because of the very strict law in the UK many couples look outside the UK for the possibility of undergoing an arrangement mm. Mm. and and to, to that extent um, just at the biological level the child normally um, that the woman is carrying it isn't biologically related in that sense to her it's normally a situation in which it's it's uh, two other parents who are as it were the, the biological parents of that child yes yeah, so that's the difference between surrogacy and the normal kind of IVF uh, in in normal IVF mm. the um, the commonest kind of IVF people would would the egg and the sperm are created by a couple and and then the embryo is implanted back in the womb of the person who do, who donated the egg but it is possible yeah. to have other combinations so you can have embryo donation whereby another couple donate the embryo to a to a woman she carries the baby and then looks after the baby once the baby is born so mm. it's it's fascinating mm. really how there are many many different uh, options of course what surrogacy has become then particularly relevant for same-sex couples um, both male mm. and female same-sex couples uh, who wish to have a child and uh, particularly for male same-sex couples this is really the only way th that a male same-sex couple could have a baby who is genetically related to one of the one of the males and um, yeah. this is now become relatively common that two men would agree together they would create an embryo getting an egg from somewhere else they would then transfer the embryo uh, into the womb of a surrogate mother and then they would say this is our child yeah so I, I and I have heard of this and you know there are various sort of nouns give names given to it you, you you've used the term reproductive tourism I've heard of the term wombs for rent um uh, tell us Tim what's the so what what are you seeing uh, internationally in terms of the places where there is a more liberal approach to to surrogacy uh such, places such as Ukraine mm. Well, as as you mentioned at the start, there's been a lot of focus at the moment on Ukraine, obviously because of the 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 situation there with Russia about to already invading. Ukraine has become uh, one of the kind of leading centres in in Europe of of this surrogacy industry, as we could call it. Um, it unlike in the UK and and in most uh, Western European countries, um, it's not illegal to to do it as a for profit arrangement, and which means that there are now a number of agencies uh, which kind of advertise their services um in in the west and so there's a number of particularly irish for some reason couples who have um who who have commissioned uh, a mother a woman in ukraine to carry their child for them um due to give birth or about have just given birth and they're unable to get into i to ukraine to collect their child and bring them home because of the imminent conflict um but it's not just ukraine it's it's, it's not unheard of in other former kind of soviet bloc countries in the east in eastern europe but also globally uh, places like india lots of other places in southeast asia um, unfortunately, this really points to something that that makes me slightly uncomfortable about it, which is that it almost it, it almost exclusively tends to be uh, uh, richer uh, Western people um, hiring, effectively hiring out the wombs of of women from from the majority world. It, it tends to be living in poorer countries because the sums of money here are are extraordinary. You know, if it's if if your if your Irish couple are paying maybe twenty five thirty thousand euros for the service. Um, the agency takes an enormous cut, more than 50% of it, but that still means 10,000 euros for a woman in Ukraine, where I think the average annual salary is, is only a few thousand euros, is, is an astronomical sum. So you can see there's, there's real uh, financial benefit there, but also real risk for exploitation. Mm, absolutely. Uh, I mean, John, wh where do you land on all of this? I mean, you can understand why with the technology available and if the law allows it people would go down this route because infertility i can imagine for many couples is just the, the worst thing they can face and and there's a huge desire to have to have a child and so on what, what so you can understand the 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 motive what where where do your concerns lie as it were in the way that this is now developing well absolutely so from a christian point of view i do think that that's where you have to start you have to start with the pain of infertility mm. and and to do to to recognize and empathize with the fact the desperate desire 
that couples have to have a child. And uh, and I think that infertility is often not recognised as such, including by Christians. And I think Christian churches can be incredibly insensitive uh, towards uh, their own members, some of whom are struggling to have children. You know, so often uh, churches these days are very family orientated. There's a great emphasis on the children's service and celebrating when a new baby's born and Mother's Day and all that kind of stuff. And and yet uh, the statistics show that one in seven uh, couples on average will be unable to have a baby without technological help. And so, you know, there, there are many, many couples who struggle with this. So, so I think we start there and say, yes, this is a very real pain. And I, I therefore don't want to just say, well, reproductive technology is wrong and it's evil and it, and it should never be considered. And, and indeed, you know, I've had private conversations with a whole number of, of couples who've agonized about, you know, what would be the, the ethical issues about going down this kind of route. Um, but I, I, my own feeling is that if for a, a husband and wife who are married, to generate an embryo in the womb and in, in the in the lab and then to insert it back into the woman's uh, womb so that she can have a baby. That seems to me like an appropriate use of reproductive technology. It's something that you can defend. It, it's sort of restoring the masterpiece mm. to use mm. a, an analogy. Whereas surrogacy seems to me to go into a really different kind of territory, which carries within itself all kinds of of complications you know what happens when the mother doesn't want to give the baby back mm. uh, what happens if it turns out that the baby has some uh, disability and there have been cases where a baby's been born with down syndrome and, and then the initial couple have refused to take the Gosh. baby back and right. then you know what what happens if the mother has some very severe illness during pregnancy mm. and she might even die as a result mm. of the complications of the pregnancy so there are many, many possibilities of things going horribly wrong. And also there's the question of identity. You know, who does this child, how does the child understand who, who they are? Mm. Uh, and of course, these kind of identity problems are very common in our world anyway, but it does seem as though the technology is, is adding to the, to the complications. Mm. And then finally, I would want to say, you know, as we've already said, there's this kind of power imbalance and what we see so often is that technology accentuates the power imbalances in our world. So it's 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 the rich and it's the powerful, it's the strong who are effectively uh, dominating and even abusing those who are weak and vulnerable. And technology, paradoxically, you would hope that technology had mm. the effects of balancing everything out. That whereas paradoxically, it often seems it works in exactly the opposite direction. Yeah. And, and I guess that's the, the great danger is is also that as much as you can see the attraction for a, a woman in Ukraine to potentially, as it were, offer herself in this way, there is potentially an abuse going on at the same time, Tim, when it comes to essentially people who are more rich, more powerful, effectively treating these women as, as a for something that feels like it should be sacred almost. Uh, it's It almost feels like it becomes a a commodification almost of a woman's body in this way and and I guess you would have a concern as, as a Christian just on that front a absolutely right I think I think it, it, it tells a slight lie or a comforting untruth which is that women and their wombs can be separated but a womb for it to be able to carry a child to term is not just a standalone vessel that you can just hire from another person it is intimately connected and is an intrinsic part of the holistic whole of that of that human being and so you know, even if both parties, both the commissioning mother and the carrying mother, believe that this is a simple commercial arrangement, the reality is, I understand, I'm, I'm told, and the evidence supports this when they've done studies, is that spending nine months nurturing a life inside you, even if you know and intend to give mm. that child to someone else, like that has an effect on you, that you are now forever a, a one of the mothers of that child. And, and I think splitting, we, we talked about this before, John, about the procreative and the unitive bond. And, and in Christian theology, the, the kind of God's ideal is that the procreation of children is takes part within the unity of a marriage. And, and, and therefore, the act of sex is not just 
uh, simply about building intimacy or simply about procreation, but it's somehow mysteriously both at the same time. And and all of these surrogacy, surrogacy, and to some extent other forms of reproductive technology, they are separating out this the God's God's design. Now I understand that that, and I agree with John that not all forms of technology are, are are would be wrong for Christians to pursue. Absolutely not. But I do think we need to think really carefully about what is that people are are not means they're ends in themselves and that's true both of the child are we treating the future potential child as a means to satisfy something within ourselves as a couple mm. but also the surrogate mother she's not simply a womb for hire she's a whole complete human person and yeah i i just have real real worries about what impact it has upon us and upon our humanity yeah. upon the image of god in us to go through this kind of process i i suppose it you know that there are so many different ways in which these things can occur as well and i'm sure different people will have different relationships with the birth mother and so on as you said john it might be a family member and in a sense they become a sort of you know aunt who carried you to term or something but equally it may be that it's more of a commercial arrangement and that person is never part of their life again and and that may leave the child with questions later on i suppose about well i maybe i did want to know who 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 and, and i can imagine that's even more acute probably in the case where you might have, especially in the instance where gay gay couples are wanting to bring children into the world in this way, there might be uh, another egg. You know, it's only one of the men who's, uh, or one of the women who, who's, if it, like genetic DNA is part of that child. Now, in that instance, that raises a whole nother question of, well, does a child have a right to know who their biological parents are? Or, or is it okay for, you know, the parents of this child to say, well, actually, no, we decided... The, the, to, to, to do do it this way i mean th this is a whole nother <laughs> huge huge topic john but, but any thoughts before yeah we no, break? I, yeah absolutely is and i i think um there's a fascinating book i read some years ago which is just called who am i question mark and it just tells the stories of a whole number of adults who were conceived through different forms of reproductive technology particularly sperm or egg donation mm. and they described the often the way they had come into the world had been hidden from them by the people who they thought were their parents. It had all been concealed. It was a matter of shame. Mm -hmm. And then gradually they become aware of the fact that they don't seem to be genetically related to to the person they thought was their father or their mother. And, and then they go on this quest. And then sometimes, you know, they discover they have 20 or 50 uh, half siblings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, um, but w what came out of, the book quite strongly was that many of these adults were said one i'm extremely happy to be alive I'm, I'm i'm very grateful for the fact that i have my life but two i don't think the people who brought me into existence were thinking about me at all they were simply thinking mm. about their own need to have a baby and they weren't thinking about how that person they were bringing into the world would actually think about themselves, what their own identity would be. And to that extent, they were being selfish. Hmm. We're, we're going to come back to this in just a moment's time. There's so many more issues I want to dig out in this whole area of reproductive ethics and surrogacy and so on. But uh, today on the show, I'm joined by John Wyatt and Tim Wyatt. Uh, they are hosts of the Matters of Life and Death podcast, which has just joined the premier unbelievable suite of podcasts. So you can find the link to it and get more great discussions uh, between them both from the podcast. But we'll be back in just a moment's time. Can you hear me? Is this working? We've all got used to muting and unmuting ourselves in recent years, but in our confused and divided culture, when Christians feel nervous about speaking up, it feels like God has been put on mute too. Well, this May, Premier Unbelievable The Conference is coming live from the British Library London as leading thinkers help the church and you to find your authentic voice again. Alistair McGrath, John Wyatt, Lisa Fields, Glenn Scrivener, Sharon Dirox, Joseph D'Souza, Phil Vischer, Sky Jatani, and more guests will show how Christians can speak with truth and grace in troubled times. Plus, there'll be the global launch of our brand new ministry, helping skeptics to explore faith and Christians to share their faith with confidence. Not only that, your ticket includes our live big conversation event with renowned brain psychologist Ian McGilchrist and Christian neuroscientist Sharon Dirks on whether there's a master who made our mind. You can attend in person or online from anywhere in the world. So join me, Justin Briley, on Saturday the 14th of May for this year's conference Find out more at unbelievable.live 
and let's take God off mute. Welcome back to today's show. I'm joined by John Wyatt and Tim Wyatt. Uh, they are the father and son hosts of the Matters of Life and Death podcast. You can find a link to the podcast from today's show. Um, but we've been talking on the show today about issues around surrogacy, um, reproductive technology, uh, what's sometimes called the reproductive tourism. Uh, and we were hearing about the case in Ukraine, which obviously there's a lot of tensions and that's only served to um, really further com complexify the situation for uh, surrogate mothers uh, in Ukraine and the couples who are waiting for babies in other parts of the world. Um, I, I know that back in when lockdown struck, there was an interesting article um, in The Guardian that you sent me, John, uh, in which it talked about the the industry around this uh, that exists in Ukraine. But as as you said, I think it, it's, it occurs in many other countries as well. But we did get onto the subject of of what happens, not just in the surrogacy situation, where there may well be, you know, at least the, the biological, you know, parents are both involved in, in the, the baby that is produced. But there's also, the, you know, many other instances where it, there may not be um, a biological connection on the part of one parent, um, especially, you know, as you increasingly um, uh, gay couples are wanting to have children, but there can only um, be, be one sort of partner, as it were, represented genetically there. So, so what kind of um, complexities is that bringing into the lives of children into just the legal aspect, I suppose, as well of of parenting and that kind of thing, John. Yeah, well, this is another good example of how, as technology advances, it raises all kinds of unforeseen uh, questions. And uh, just going back briefly to Ukraine, Ukraine is an interesting country because in terms of technology, reproductive technology, it's actually very advanced. It's got some of the best high quality, you know, anything that you could have in the West would be available in Ukraine in some of those major centres, uh, but it has a much more lax regulatory uh, mm. framework. And, and there are many countries around the world where that's the case. You have extremely advanced technology, but with a much more underdeveloped legal and ethical framework. In fact, mm. I can remember I was traveling in Southeast Asia and talked to the dean of a medical school there, and we were talking about ethics and so on. And he said, you know, we've got all your Western hardware, but we don't have your software. Uh, but, <laughs> but, and that's what exactly what he meant. He said the whole ethical tradition and legal tradition, which we've developed over the centuries here, and what's happening around the world is, is the technology can be transplanted. Now, if, you, if you've got a few million dollars, you can create completely from fresh uh, a cutting edge reproductive technology lab. But in and, and hire the specialists and so on. But but the question is how how you use this technology. Mm. And certainly here in the UK, we've been wrestling with this for fifty years nearly. And um, uh, interesting dilemmas about what you put on the birth certificate. The, the birth certificate becomes a very important legal document. And um, what's been decided is that, uh, for instance, in the case of two men, a uh, same-sex couple who uh, use surrogacy to have a baby, that they can apply to have the two men names go on the birth certificate as two, quotes parents. And the law says in that case that no person shall be the mother of the child. In other words, the law defines that says there is no mother. As far as the law is concerned, there are two parents and they're both men. Mm. So it's a fascinating kind of understanding yeah. of parenthood, that parenthood is ultimately a kind of social construct. It, it, it's, it's lost its connection with the basic mm. biology. Mm. Mm. I, I would assume, though, even in that what sounds to me quite extreme case, there would need to be some biological record of the mother just from the point of view of if there were heritable diseases you would want to know and so on so so is there a sort of difference between the the legal side and maybe what is in the child's medical records where you would want to obviously have some some information about the mother well actually that's a, that is a huge problem because the way that the um hfea act is 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 um said in the in, is framed in the uk is that it would be a criminal offence for uh, confidential medical information to be released against the wishes of the parents. Wow. So it's entirely up to the parents. If the parents don't wish anyone to know who the literal biological mother of this child is, then even the medics 
can be locked out of that information. And as you say, that potentially has enormous implications about if a genetic mm. disorder becomes apparent mm. and so on. So, so it, it does, there's a, there's, a, there's a tension here. On the one hand, the law is trying to protect confidentiality and trying to prevent stigmatization of a, of a, of a child who's being conceived in this very unusual way. On the other hand, there are you can't avoid the biology, mm, the mm. implications of the biology. I mean, Tim, it's it's got almost overtones as well of the current debate going on around transgender as well, where, you know, people want to have the ability to change their gender on a birth certificate and so on if they feel it's, it's it doesn't represent who they are and so on. But that has all sorts of legal and medical implications for, for, for what you then do if, if you can't, you know tell or you know if, and so on so yeah any any thoughts on on sort of the the quandaries that this brings yeah us into? i was gonna say what what really fascinates me is that there's it's mirroring but almost in reverse a, a discussion which has happened in, in the world of adoption so in some ways adoption was almost like a pre-medical form of reproductive technology when ch when couples you know be going on for thousands of years when couples who can't have children would adopt some, another, another couple's child and historically it was done in the same way you know that they would be a new birth certificate would be drawn up with the adoptive family on there and and most couples chose not to tell that child it was a big secret and we tried to almost wish away and pretend in some sense that this child was biologically mm, theirs mm, but mm. actually there's been decades of research which has flipped it on its head and the contemporary adoption kind of best practice is the total reverse and so rather than erasing the kind of biological reality which is what we've been trying to say with you know with these rewriting birth certificates or, or or um you know using surrogates there's actually the best practice in adoption is now to actually to raise the child always knowing that they have a biological mother and a father elsewhere um and, so, and in some cases where it's safe to do so they even have ongoing kind of relationship and contact with that child uh, and, and so it's not about erasing and denying the the reality and trying to wish away what has actually happened it's about the, the evidence is, is that children even if they are adopted at an incredibly young age and have no memory of their birth family when they reach a certain age it's quite common if not more common than not for that child to want to have some kind of relationship with their biological family and we're discovering that actually biology matters we can't wish it away we can't uh, wipe it away with a, with, a, with a magic wand or with some crazy technologies that people really do care which mother carried them to term and what time and day they were born and you know what, what where they come from who their people are what their kin is that is that is hard baked into us to care about that and identity even if you're really happy with your adoptive yeah. family or your commissioning family i suspect many many children will want to know something about the surrogate mother who carried them and, and and to that extent, do you feel the same policy should be adopted then, uh, you know, uh, as as currently exists in, in adoption, that, that the best route is to, to have that, whether it be adoption or IVF or uh, surrogacy, um, donor sperm and so on? I have to say, I think I probably do. I, I think it's a complex issue and I need to reflect on it a bit more. But I, I think if I was a child that was conceived through some form of reproductive technology, I think I would want to know. And I think I might even say, I think I have a right to know. A, a child is not the possession of their parents. They grow into becoming their own independent, autonomous human being. And I think it is probably the child's, it is the child's story to know. And I don't really, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that that, that, that basic facts about how they came to be and who they, where they come from can, can be obscured or obfuscated in some mm. way. So it's interesting how the, um, the regulatory authorities have struggled with these kind of issues and, and the compromises occurred in the UK is that once you get to 18 you are able to approach the HFEA and ask for information about your origins but there's no legal or uh, duty on your parents to tell you mm. in advance um, and there was an anxiety amongst the um, amongst the, the planners and the regulators that it would be possible that I would fall in love with this other person who was actually genetically related to right, me yes. through the same donor and not know that. And in fact, there have been this bizarre cases where people are, find a, a romantic or sexual attraction to this stranger who turns out to have a, an unknown genetic relationship. Mm. So in order to get around this problem, the, what the HFEA advises you is that if you before you decide to pair up with somebody and particularly before you decide to have a baby with them you should contact the HFEA 
and ask them whether or not you're genetically related to this person with whom you are planning to have a baby. And they will look into their records and will then tell you either yes or no, you, this wow. is an appropriate relationship or but, no, this is not an appropriate relationship. But that, that would be contingent on you even being told in the first place that, that you were conceived in such a way. And, and are you saying there isn't any legal obligation on the parents to do that or should they do that when they reach 18 is that is that no legal there's obligation? no legal obligation right. and in fact all the evidence is that the vast majority of parents don't or at least a, a significant right so it, it would be perfectly possible that uh, that all of us unknown to us well probably not me because yeah. it didn't exist when i was <laughs> when i was being conceived but possibly you unknown to you you were yeah. conceived through donor yeah donor gametes and your parents concealed it from Gosh. you yeah. and, and they, of course the parents often tell themselves not untruthfully that that they're doing this to protect the child because the child will be devastated to discover that actually that they're, they're they're genetically unrelated or only half related to their parents but i think again there's actually been lots of studies done about adoptive children who are in the same in the same boat and actually the evidence is that while it is a painful realization in the long run it is often mm. healthier for a mm. child to not live in mm. secrecy and to grow up knowing that they come from a complicated background but at least they understand what that background is well, well, i mean as you've said tim you know in days gone by before these technologies were available adoption would have been the natural course for many parents who do um experience infertility so is this now competing with that? Is is it causing any issues with the numbers of children that are being adopted in your, your experience? What What's the situation when it comes to adoption? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Justin, because it actually has changed the adoption landscape quite significantly. So it, historically, if you look at the, this is talking about the UK, where I'm most familiar with, it, there was the, the majority of children kind of in the system available for adoptive parents would be very young babies, um, largely born to unmarried women. And it was kind of culturally and socially unacceptable mm. for, for single women to, to raise raise a child. Um, and, and as such, therefore, um, most adoptions were kind of young babies um, without any kind of significant background of, of social services input. And that has completely changed. Uh, primarily because of uh, the legalization of abortion it has to be said and that many of these mm, children mm. the pregnancies are no longer carried to term but also because socially it's more acceptable for for young women to have have babies outside of wedlock and so now um adoption as you say is is uh the children in the system are 99 plus percent they're not they're not young children who've been relinquished voluntarily right. by a mother mm. they're children who've been forcibly removed by social services but as you say it's also now competing adoption is just one of the slate of options and when and my understanding is w when you kind of go through the infertility diagnosis this is not from personal experience but i understand that that you are t generally steered towards medical options because you're being told by a doctor and so i know and i i kind of worry is a strong word but i i fear that that actually adoption which is for many couples can be a, a really positive and affirming redemptive solution to infertility is just something they're not being offered or not thinking about because there is now this dizzying array of frankly more financially lucrative options for for the medical professionals to push you towards yeah, I'm afraid that's, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a lot of elements of truth in that. And, and one of the things which, again, we just have to acknowledge is that reproductive technology is extraordinarily uh, commercially uh, productive. You know, that, that uh, fertility specialists are some of the best paid doctors in the world. Uh, it's not unusual for them to be grossing enormous sums. And um, so there is a very strong commercial aspect here. And 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 there's also a kind of uh, commodification or consumerism, you know, which I, as a paediatrician, were often often sensitive to. This idea that that parents want to have a baby who's a perfect baby, who they've got in their mind's eye. You know, here we are as a couple, but we don't have this baby, and if only we could have this baby. You know, this perfect baby. Um, that was that was part of us this would just make our life complete and this would just be wonderful and and so the baby is really a almost like a, a product uh, and and then when you suggest adoption oh yeah but that would be somebody else's baby and you know they mm. might have some problems and i'm not sure they would fit in and 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 it would be much better for us to start again and create our own baby and it there's a there's a really uh I think a sad aspect really but the 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 as a pediatrician you know we need to see 
each person as 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 unique and value in in their own right and and when you think there are so many thousands of unwanted children um, in the care system just in the UK as well as across the world that, that then to be using very sophisticated technology to create another child because they are genetically related to me does mm. uh, does create concerns for me and and to potentially obviously has these knock-on effects of creating a sort of potentially ethically questionable systems by which children are you know are brought into being through uh, countries where there are these more lax sort of regulations and, and the potential abuses that that, that can yeah and, and this is incur. definitely a recurring theme that we start with mm. a human problem yes it's a it's an ancient human problem I and mean, infertility uh, difficulty in having children goes back you know you can find it in the bible can't you all these cases yeah, yeah. of where infertility is very much part of the narrative um but what's new is now we're going to use cutting edge technology to solve this ancient human problem uh, but what we're not so aware of is all these new complexities and and problems and power imbalances which the technology brings in it isn't just a neutral uh, kind of uh, intervention it carries with it a whole lot of other uh, challenges yeah. questions and 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 often the price we pay it's like the technologists are saying you know you want a baby we'll give you a baby but it will cost you and what that cost is is often not more just an economic cost it's a it's a whole human and ethical cost as well yeah I, I mean I almost wonder Tim whether as John said, the, the consumerism aspect of this, without wanting to judge the pain, you know, that, that couples go through. And I can un fully understand why this would be such a, uh, you know, an option on the table for so many people. But but at the same time, is it taking us towards this idea that a child is somehow a right um, rather than a gift in a sense, and that there will be situations, as there always have been historically, where people are not in a position to have their own child. And, and again, you know, that's why adoption has been, you know, in a sense, you'll find adoption throughout the Bible as well, won't you? It's, it's given almost a very, you know, we are, you know, Christians talk about being adopted as sons and daughters of God. There's a, it's almost a divine thing in Scripture. So so I guess it's that whole question of, of you know, are we going down the line of seeing simply children as, as a right rather than a gift in, in that sense, Tim? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I was going to say, I mean, a, there's a real theological angle here that we need to discuss as well, which, which is which is that the, this longing for a child that is of my DNA, we might have used in previous, in biblical language, from my blood, in my bloodline, mm. is, is, a, is a deep, deep longing. And as you say, we need to be really careful here because I don't want to cast aspersions on couples, Christian couples, who feel that pain. I know people in that situation, mm. it, is, it is incredibly painful. Um, it's a real wound. And, and, and we see it throughout, as you say, throughout scripture, this is an ancient wound. Um, but I think there is an important transition from old to new testament that we need to reckon with as christians which is that with the coming of christ and the kind of bringing of this new family of god we the the, the gospel pivots away from bloodlines and says actually in the kingdom of god there is a different understanding of family mm. And we have that because we call each other brothers and sisters when we share no DNA. And I think that's also true inside families that this, that's what's powerful about adoption, as you say, is it mirrors what has happened with us, our spiritual adoption. We've been grafted into the family of God, but also it mirrors something about the church. And that's true for, for couples who, who don't have children, whether through adoption or any means, they can still be part of family. In the world, we say family is determined by who you're related to biologically. But in the church, we say you could have brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, mothers, fathers who have no connection to you by blood, by DNA, by any technology, but they are significant spiritual family. And I think it's really important that Christians don't fall into the trap of believing the world's conception of family, which is all driven by DNA, by blood. Um, and that drives people to, to spend these enormous amounts socially and financially and actually say whether through adoption or just simply through being grafted into the family of God in a church environment, you can find real spiritual, meaningful, eternal family through a different means. Yeah. I think that's fantastic mm. i totally agree I, and i think theologically it's helpful to see that the the bloodline as you put it is is really talking about creation isn't it it's it's having children it's what creation gives us this ability of making love and making babies and what the reproductive technology is doing is sort of grafting onto creation it's taking the ability of a sperm and an egg and a womb it, it's it's all about creation but as you say in the New Testament, the emphasis shifts. It doesn't nullify creation, but the emphasis shifts towards grace. 
And so adoption, when we adopt a child who desperately needs a family, the primary motivation is not about, you know, I'm creating a child for myself, but I am showing grace, showing uh, compassion, love uh, to a child who desperately needs a family. Mm. And, and it's important not to confuse those two things. Creation and grace are not the same thing. Yeah. I, I mean, John, what, how would you then counsel perhaps let's say a Christian couple specifically who have reached a point where they've realized that they, they can't conceive naturally um, and are looking at the options on the table here. Um, and it could be a sperm donor uh, or an egg donor. Um, it could be their own uh, sperm and egg, but with a uh, surrogate mother um, or it could be adoption. Um, it could be IVF, um, you know, there are a number of different possibilities that, that, that depending on the circumstance, where, where would you begin with, with a couple who are in that position, John? Yeah, well, and as we said at the beginning, I think the first place to begin is to empathise with the pain mm. and not just to leap towards the solution, but, but uh, to recognise the pain and, and, and the fact that, sadly, you know, many of us struggle with painful realities which we didn't choose uh, but this is uh, you know the, the biology I often think that you know as modern people we're control freaks we we control so many aspects of our life and um, and it's like biology is the last um, frontier that we're not able to control and it's almost like you know our, our creator almighty God holds back biology and says you're not the boss you don't control your life you're not you cannot make it happen uh, and so i think to start by empathizing the pain um, and then i would uh, quite gently sort of just explore have you thought about you know do you, you need to think in advance what the implications will be you know have you have you thought about um what the implications would be about going for ivf you know the e even you know the so-called normal kind of IVF, which is where you take the egg and the sperm uh, together, it, it still can have enormous psychological consequences. I mean, it's, you know, because in our, when you're making love with your, with your partner and your, your, your spouse, it's like you're at the most intimate and vulnerable part of your, of your relationship. And and yet, what happens when the IVF is? It's like you're in the bedroom with your with your partner, and all of a sudden the lights come on, and all these people with white coats come marching into the bedroom and say, "Okay, well, I need a sperm sample from here, mm -hmm. and we need mm -hmm. to check the cervical mucus here, and then you need to have an injection here." And and this most intimate and vulnerable part of our relationship is now suddenly being exposed in in what can be quite a invasive and, and mm. painful way so thinking through the psychological consequences thinking through what would happen if something went wrong have you mm -hmm. thought about how you would feel uh, you know you, you're going to have to live with this decision for the rest of your life have, have you thought about what you would say to the child and what the implications would be um, there's something called um, using natural fertility technology um, actually there's quite a lot of evidence that rather than go straight to the technology if we uh, try to actually encourage the natural process, try to understand why this couple are infertile, and there has been evidence um, uh, ar around the world, and studies have shown that in some cases, just concentrating on on the natural, uh, on enhancing natural fertility can be quite successful. But I certainly would raise the possibility of adoption and um, and and of of, of asking people to think really think what is my motivation what is driving me and would it be possible that we could um, offer hospitality to a child who desperately needs a family there's a, there's another ethical concern mm. that a lot of christians i know who are in this position and wrestle with when it comes to ivf which is the so-called problem of the surplus embryos because uh, uh, as the system works as far as i understand it the, the doctors kind of um prompt super ovulation to produce multiple eggs sometimes as many as 25 or 30 eggs rather than just the one egg you would normally produce in your menstrual cycle they're then harvested uh, and you don't um, you could you, you don't you only reimplant one or two after you fertilize them in the test tube in the lab and and um, therefore you ha you have the question of what do you do with the 25 or more kind of 
fertilized embryos that are just on in cold storage in hiatus and some couples will keep them back and attempt a subsequent cycle of ivf with them uh but in many cases they would be donated for embryo research and the law says after 14 days they must be destroyed um or they sit there on ice for 10 years and there's a time limit again i think where after them they have to be destroyed and mm. obviously if you're some christians many christians would believe that life life begins at conception these aren't just eight cell embryos these are human beings mm. Um, mm. and so there's a real ethical dilemma about is there a way of doing ivf that that doesn't involve superovulation and where we don't Get, have these kind of leftover children lying around in in, in cold storage mm, mm. yes i remember going into work years ago on the underground you know in the old underground as it was everybody was reading newspapers so you could read the headlines of the newspaper someone sitting off opposite you and i was staring at this headline and i kept staring at this headline in the end i had to go after i got off the underground i had to go and buy the newspaper to see what it was what the story was because it said i still love my frozen babies and i kept saying i still love my frozen <laughs> wow. babies and it turned out it was a story about embryos that were the been a sort of there'd been a, uh, a rupture yeah. between the couple uh, one said they they wanted them to be destroyed. The yeah. other one said, "No, I still love my frozen babies." Yeah, well, these these are the, the sort of the way that technology produces unique problems that we never, in a sense, had to face before. But for understandable reasons, you know, when you have the technology, it's so tempting to use it to to fulfil what is often the, the the most central desire in someone's life. Um, we'll 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 just have another five or ten minutes on the other side of a break uh, and remind people about the new podcast as well uh, where you can get far more in-depth conversations about all these issues i know you've covered ivf um, surrogacy and, and all kinds of other issues as well around reproduction but also beginning end of life issues technology transhumanism everything else um, so uh, I'll, I'll again remind people of how to get hold of the matters of life and death podcast but uh, we're talking today about reproductive ethics my guests are john and tim wyatt have you ever found yourself tongue-tied when someone asks you, is there evidence for God? What about suffering? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, our online apologetics course, featuring video training from world-renowned thinkers such as William Lane Craig, John Lennox, Amy Or Ewing and Gary Habermas. You'll learn how to understand, defend and share your faith with confidence. I'll also share lessons I've learned from over 15 years of hosting atheists and Christians in dialogue. You can enrol now at premier.org.uk forward slash course or click the link with this video. Well, it's been a really interesting discussion today on uh, surrogacy, paying for pregnancy, um, lots of other issues as well around reproductive technology. Um, I mean, I'm aware tim as as we finish up today it's not just christians who listen to the unbelievable show but plenty of non-christians as well who many of whom may have you know experienced infertility um gone down some of the routes we've been talking about um and maybe for them they don't necessarily see that there's a sort of divine issue here that that aspect of the moral question doesn't particularly factor for them but so is i mean if 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 ultimately let's say just as a thought experiment we are ultimately sort of material in origin that we you know and and yes a, a clump of cells in the early stages is just a clump of cells perhaps um i mean does that make the this kind of conversation irrelevant to to someone who doesn't share the faith of a christian when it comes to issues around um the way we bring children into the world and parenting and i don't think it does actually justin i think regardless of what you think happens uh kind of before conception uh or, or what the status of that clump of cells is what is what is it undeniable is that clump of cells if in the right conditions will grow into being a person a a and that person um like we talked about before they're not simply um uh, a kind of disembodied uh sense of self but yourself is 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 encoded into your physicality is into your flesh those those eight those two four eight sixteen cells became millions and billions of cells and they are who you are mm. and, and as i said all the evidence is is that that people don't we we can wish away some of the the the, the brokenness of our physicality but and and conceive children through various eccentric and, and and exciting technological means but fundamentally those children grow up to become adults and they have the same that the same kind of concerns about their materiality where they come from and so i think these are really important questions for anyone from any kind of set of any faith or none to ask is what does it feel like for the child 
who is conceived via surrogacy or embryo donation or, or, or IVF and sperm donation, what questions will they have about who they are and where they come from when they when they get older? And I think it's important to say that, you know, I, I personally, I'm not kind of condemning or damning all re reproductive technology as as mm. as the wrong thing to do but i think there are some really really critical questions we need to ask ourselves not just about what would it mean for me but what would it mean for that child when they are 18 25 30 35 ask questions about who they are and where they come mm. from because ultimately that's what this is for people aren't uh means to an end children aren't a way to fulfill ourselves they are ends in themselves and therefore their needs their feelings their identity their sense of self must be paramount in our decision making. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, John, it, it, it so much of this comes down to that that age old question that obviously applies to Christians as well as non Christians. Of well, you may have the technology to do something, but should you use it to do something? And, and yeah, yeah, what's fascinating to me is that you know these these are age old questions about what it means to be human. You know, what's the purpose of existence? What are the relationships between parents and children? Uh, you know, inheritance, all those kind of things. What's fascinating to me is that as the technology advances, it raises those age old questions, but with a new take. And I find that it's not just people of faith or people who are Christians or come from a religious tradition. It's often many people um, want to engage with these questions because they recognize that these are really important. These, these fundamental questions about what it means to be human and also what kind of society do we want to build for the future? What kind of world do we want to create for our children to be born into? These, these are vital questions for everybody. And uh, yes, I think that as Christians, we do have something very specific and actually amazingly relevant to contribute mm. to this important debate tell us um what what you're looking forward to doing as you go forward in this new endeavor the matters of life and death podcast i'm so thrilled again that we're being bringing this into the the sort of the orbit of the premier unbelievable network um but tell us what you know what what your hopes are i suppose for those listening uh, as you unpack these kinds of issues and this is just one of a whole range of issues that you have talked about and will continue to talk about maybe tim start start us off on what, what what your hopes are for this new podcast i mean it's it's exciting really because uh we've already been kind of preparing some of our first episodes when we kind of relaunch on the on the premier mm. network and they're going to be going to be looking at this whole question of of control and technology and its intersection with humanity as we're looking at human enhancement and transhumanism and so you know research into trying to extend human life beyond 100 120 150 years things about you know could we implant tiny kind of machines into our brains to change how, how our thinking works uh what and as you say these come back to such fundamental questions about personhood about and these are questions of interest to everyone so yeah i'm, I'm really excited about i really enjoy these conversations because i get to learn a lot from my dad who's obviously an expert and has done loads of research but i think it also fleshes out we, we take go from the particular issue and we flesh out to thinking hopefully helping christians think through who might be encountering these in their lives how to how to address them but also hopefully to sharpen broader thoughts like we had that conversation about bloodlines and theology and, and the new covenant hopefully these these kind of specific social issues sharpen our thinking more broadly about how we read scripture but also even if you're not a christian how you think about kind of life the universe and everything yeah and and john i know that you've you've not only obviously done the podcasting but you've written many books uh, along these lines as well um one of your most recent was actually on the whole area of robotics wasn't it do you want to just tell us about that quickly? yeah i i was uh, part of a project um investigating the implications of robotics and ai um and particularly thinking from a, a religious and, and christian perspective and there's a book that's come out from that called the robot will see you now um which is uh, available and i'm currently trying to write another a book on on the topic of ai and um the these issues i think are are incredibly important you know that the 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 speed of transformation the work that's going on and interestingly the pandemic has actually accelerated a lot of this stuff um mm. it, it's focused more attention on the online world on technology on ai and i think over the next few years we're going to see a whole new lots of uh, new things being rolled out and it's vitally important that we think about this from a from a christian mm. point of view so i'm, I'm really excited about uh, this potential very grateful for the support from premier to be 
part of your suite of podcasts and um really looking forward to the adventure of what's yeah. what's to come well there's a link to the podcast from today's show do go and subscribe to it um i, I can promise you since i've subscribed i've just found them so interesting the conversations be- between tim and john um uh, and and we're going to be bringing many more in the future um also so glad john that you're part of our speaker lineup for the unbelievable conference coming live from the british library in london on saturday the 14th of may and um and for what you'll be able to bring to us as we learn how to speak with grace and truth into these ever increasing complex situations that that we're presented with but but how we can do that with with the spirit of christ uh within us but thank you very much both for being with me on today's show great thank yeah, you thanks justin For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.